David Horn is widely regarded as one of the most talented Scottish musicians of his generation. While still a teenager, he established his name both as a pianist, winning the piano section of the BBC Young Musician of the Year in 1988, and making his BBC Proms Concerto debut in 1990, and as a composer with a prize-winning work at the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival. His composition studies took him to the USA, first at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, and then at Harvard University, where he obtained his PhD in 1999. David is currently Professor of Music and Head of Graduate School at the Royal Northern College of Music, Manchester. He also directs HARP, the college's hub for artistic research into performance. He supervises a wide range of composition, performance and musicology PhD students. As a composer, David is regularly commissioned and performed worldwide by groups as diverse as Scottish Opera, the BBC Symphony, BBC Scottish and BBC Philharmonic Orchestras, the Nash Ensemble, Remix Ensemble Portugal and the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Centre. International soloists such as Evelyn Glenny, Boris Berzovsky, Nabuku Imai and Fred Sherry have also commissioned works from him. He was composer in association with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra from 2000 to 2004. As a pianist, David has performed as soloist with orchestras, including the BBC Symphony Orchestra, Symphony of Birmingham, City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, London, London Sinfonietta, and Royal Scottish National Orchestra. A respected teacher and mentor, David is in demand as an educator at all levels. He has mentored emerging composers on making music's Adopt a Composer programme for a decade, and frequently advises and mentors composers on sound and music projects. He has a keen interest in working with younger musicians, is a key tutor on the Sound and Music Summer School, and leads education projects throughout the United Kingdom. And we are really delighted to have David with us today to present this guest lecture entitled Composition and Performance Before, After and Beyond Lockdown. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to see you all. Um, I'm sure everyone now is quite used to Zoom protocols, so um, obviously you want to keep your microphone off. I'm very happy for you to keep your video on if that's what you want to do. Um, even when I go into presenter mode, I'll still see people here and it's just lovely to actually see people. I think we've been so used to being in quite isolated environments. Um, it's just great to kind of make this contact. So I, I will be um, sharing slides um, with music that you'll be able to see in quite a lot of detail. And also I'll be sharing audio. Um, audio sharing over Zoom actually works surprisingly well. Um, so you might want to make sure you've got good speakers or you might want to put your headsets on. So let me go into the screen share first. Um, so there's the obligatory introductory slide. Um, now, like many of you, um, most of my creative work has been taking place at home in the last six months. So this is um, what I would normally look like um, at my desk when I'm composing at home with the typical Manchester sunshine streaming through the window, as you can see. Um, I'm currently talking to you from my office at the Royal Northern College of Music, um, where, um, as, as you are at the Academy, we're having very much a, a blended environment at the moment. So composition and performance and what it means when we are not able to be physically together is really the essence of my talk today. And I'm going to frame it through three compositions that you will hear parts of. But first of all, um, I think Rink's statement here is really crucial. This idea of performance taking place within time and, and at time and how both performers and composers themselves um, engage with this throughout their practice. I'm also fascinated with um, ensemble performance in, in all possible variations and varieties. And this idea of um, musical and social interaction, I think, is really important and clearly one thing that we have missed. Um, I first gave a version of this talk in, in early May. I've updated it, including some, some new music. But at that time, 
I was very struck and, and I have to say a little bit mildly disturbed that we were seeing so many images in social media and the news of orchestras quite happily playing together, edited together and we'd have like 30 or 40 people. And of course that was great in one way, but it was getting the way of the fact of course that this kind of music making wasn't happening live and that it was very much kind of relying on, on editing. So the idea of an interaction, I'm, I love this, this term from Goodman and the process of hunting in, in the sense that musicians will follow each other. That seems to me such a, an important part of music making, not only for performers, but something that composers will also be taking into account when they're creating their music. The mutual adjustment as well, cooperation, I think is, is something which is really important in, in my own practice. I'm constantly thinking when I write something, how will another performer in the ensemble react to this? How will they hear it? How will they respond? And this also is really good. And we're going to get, to get back to this. Um, the whole notion of what it means to play in time. Um, I, was, I was doing a lecture earlier this morning where I introduced um, people in the class to the notion that actually as human beings, it's impossible for us to play in time in that we don't have a computer clock which allows us to play a regular beat. And um, even someone like a drum player who can play very, very regularly, still the notion of how they play in time is actually not at all what a computer would consider playing in synchronization. Collaboration, of course, is really important, interpersonal dynamics. So without further ado, um, I'm going to just play a little couple of snippets from a piece that was written a couple of years ago, but was recorded just before lockdown. So it's literally my last professional recording. Um, and immediately I just want to show you examples of what I often like to do, which is really playing with performance. The passage, if you have a look at it here in green, um, you know, the, the slide on the alto recorder, the use of different fingerings, it's actually putting things out of tune. Um, even if you have a look at what I'm doing with the cello harmonics, for example, um, those natural harmonics, you combine that with open strings, what the oboe's playing. A lot of my music is already interested in actually a mix of musical ideas that, that detune. Um, and I'm going to get onto this later, this idea of intonation, when performers are used to playing in tune because they play together and they listen to each other, what happens when, when we remove them from this, this live environment. So here's just a, a little passage of, of this excerpt. And then just to move to the very end of this quite short piece, um, other things that really interest me about live performance. So in this passage, everything that the singer um, sings is being echoed by the instruments. And so you have different timbres, you have them playing in different registers. So of course, intonation is something that's always going to be kind of changing. You'll have to adapt. Um, the use of the harmonics again on the cello, because they're natural harmonics, it's, it's really not practical to, to bend the pitch in that too much. You're kind of stuck with what you're going to get with the open strings at the end of a piece. And this kind of live performance, the fragility of it, is something that has always interested me in my practice. Even the simple chord at the end, the way it's scored, purposely makes all the instruments, their registers, their, their intonation, sound somewhat disjunct. Make the 
So I'll just come out of the screen share just for a moment. Might just want to make sure you have definitely got your microphone off. Um, so, you know, the recorder, I absolutely love it. But, you know, even at the best of times, it's never going to have the same kind of equal temperament as other instruments. I actually have right here on my table um, my tenor recorder that was I was without for quite a while. So kind of putting these instruments together already has certain kinds of issues. Oh, hello, Richard Baker. I didn't know you were here. Nice to see you. Um, so I'm now going to take you on to another piece. Again, I'm, there's never going to be time to play the whole thing. So I want to just kind of introduce you to a, through a few kind of short clips of it. And this was the last piece of mine that was performed at world premiere before lockdown. And this was in early March up in Glasgow. Um, and it is the only performance I've ever had where I didn't shake hands with the performers. Um, so just to give a little bit of an aspect of um, you know, the kind of strange times that we live in. So let me take you through this piece. And again, just have a look at a few aspects of it. Oh, sorry, forget about that. There we go. Um, so this is a piece called Reflecting Instruments. Um, my purpose today is, is not to take you really in analytical detail through the piece, even conceptually to talk to you about too much about it, rather to focus on things that interest me in live performance that I think are really difficult to, to make work when we don't have that live situation. So at the beginning, you have this kind of furious sounding passage on the strings, which, if you like, is kind of resonated in the piano. Um, you know, the, the, you shouldn't really hear the piano at first. It kind of emanates if you listen to this passage. And then at the very end, an orange there, you notice how the pizzicato is very loud, but the piano is still very soft. Um, and that kind of interaction of performers is always something that has interested me. Here you have this high plucked note, it's taken over by a harmonic, that then, then switches to a, a natural harmonic as opposed to a stopped harmonic. Um, all of this is very much part of what I play with. Um, towards the end in blue, now the piano begins to kind of assert a kind of identity, but not as much still as the strings. So I just want to put this kind of opening and passage in context. So that hopefully gives a kind of taste of some of the sound world that, that interests me. Um, if you listen to that recording, which is very, very well played by, by the trio, um, you hear intonation issues. They, they always happen. I mean, frankly, even the way we perform an instrument affects its intonation. So a plucked sound has a, a different kind of timbral and pitch context to, for example, um, a bowed sound. And this interests me throughout this piece. It was something that I really wanted to, to play with. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead now, um, kind of halfway through the piece, show you some other things I was really interested in playing with. Um, resonance, not knowing quite what he's playing, the idea of one sound emerging out of another. Again, much of this really, in my view, depends on, on live performance for performance kind of listening out to each other and, and what's happening. So back into this one. Someone else um, does have their microphone off and I can hear alerts on their computers. So you might want to make sure that you definitely are muted. So in this passage here, for example, the piano, um, now the, the roles have reversed, it's playing very loud, the, the, the 
pedals on. So then what happens is the harmonics underneath kind of emerge out of this. This kind of passage occurs a lot, and, and here, for example, using these double unisons, now, at the best of time, even on one instrument, there's always a slightly dodgy intonation about it. And um, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not in any way being disre disre disrespectful to wonderful string players, but I actually like that sound. Um, and then when you combine them, particularly with quite a soft dynamic with what the piano is doing, you get this really very, very strange texture underneath. Again, here in orange, a reversal of the roles. So now the strings are playing very kind of loudly and expressively, and the piano is kind of covered underneath. Um, and the whole kind of piece is constantly playing with this. Here the double stops, kind of mixing um, with the piano sound much, much softer underneath. Um, so much of this is being played with here. <laughs> So again, you hear, um, I think, f for me, what's quite a fragile interplay. Um, dynamics as well um, fascinate, fascinate me, um, not least because I put them in a similar category to rhythm in the same way that performers cannot actually play crotchets exactly in time. We're physically not capable of it. Dynamics, of course, are all completely relative. Um, even the etymology of, of dynamics is worth a little bit of consideration. So forte, of course, comes from a word that means strong. Piano comes from a word that means flat. So it's more to do with this, in other words, um, you know, tessero piano, it just means floor in Italian. So this idea that dynamics is actually as much about identity and contrast as anything else is absolutely fascinating. Um, and of course, a performer will play a piano um, completely differently depending on the context. You know, if they have to get louder, they know they might want to begin a, soft, a bit softer. If they're going to then get a lot softer, they might begin louder. So unison um, pervades a lot of my work. Um, I sometimes, I've, I've even got a piece called Broken Unisons, um, Splintered Unisons. I'm, I'm really interested in what happens when, um, again, things are not entirely as they appear. So here there's a very, very um, simple melody um, which the piano plays entirely but then you get little dabs of colour in harmonics. And naturally, because they're all different harmonics, stopped and natural, there's a kind of slight discombobulation to the sound here. And even what you hear in, in this live recording, um, there's always a fragility in harmonics. Um, Sometimes it's hard to make them speak, you know, it depends on the string, it depends on the rosin, the bow position. Um, and this is actually a really hard thing sometimes to express because I wouldn't want to give the performers the sense that I don't care about accuracy. Um, and I know it's really hard sometimes to play these things that don't always speak. At the same time, the fragility is something that I enjoy. Um, I'll, I'll quickly just come out of the, the screen share for a moment because it, it gets into another aspect of performance which for me is very important and it's also something which I think perhaps is changing. 
There's no doubt about it that I think in the 70s and the 80s, and so the 80s was when I went to high school and when I started really listening to recordings, I think we lionised the notion of, of perfect recordings. Perhaps even worse than that, many of us, and those of you from my generation will know this quite well, quite often we only had one recording of something. Because recordings were quite expensive. You know, you'd, I'd go to the high street in Edinburgh and I'd get my cassette for six pounds. That was quite expensive. So I listened to it again and again and again. Robert Levin has um, made the argument, and I think with some um, truth, that when an audience hears Mozart's 40th Symphony, they have heard it a dozen, 30, perhaps even 50 times more than Mozart ever would have in his lifetime. Not only that, but they've often heard the same recording multiple times. And this is problematic, I think, in that audiences sometimes, and maybe even performers too, have got used to the idea of hearing something a particular way. So that when we hear things that, that have the, the wonderful, in my opinion, mistakes that often occur in live performance, it, it can irritate us. Now, for lots of reasons, some of which are actually quite serious and, and not positive, I think this has changed. Not least because of, unfortunately, what we could only call the collapse of the classical recording industry. So why has it changed? It's changed because many organisations now, um, thinking of lots of major orchestras, I don't need to name them because you'll know who they are, they don't have recording contracts anymore, so they make their own. Um, think of something like the Berlin Philharmonic Digital Concert Hall. You know, there are some wonderful mistakes in their videos that they put online. There's a fantastic performance live of Andy Valkula, where um, the associate principal clearly has a problem with his violin at the beginning of the second act, and he turns around to the person behind him and just takes their violin. <laughs> you know, because if you're going to have to play for an hour and 15 minutes, because it's just started, that's what you do. Um, now, I think with that, I think the fact that I'm not going to extol the virtue of platforms such as Spotify, but if there is an advantage there, it means that now we no longer think of just one performance of a work. So if a student is learning Chopin Opus 28 Preludes, they can now listen to literally hundreds of recordings of it. And therefore, we are perhaps getting more accustomed to hearing music played in different ways, which I would argue is good for live music. Because it has been a problem. Some of you will have heard this sometimes. Oh, I know, I didn't really enjoy that performance of Rack 2 because, oh, it sounds so much better at home. I can hear the piano. And then, of course, when you are in a concert hall and you don't have the piano mic, you suddenly wonder why, some, why sometimes you can hear the strings. You know, Rachmaninoff was a consummate orchestrator. You know, he, he really knew what he was doing. So for all the negatives of what's happened with recording and the fact, of course, that people making recordings are not getting the compensation that they deserve, I think there are some potential benefits in that maybe we're moving beyond lionising recordings and worrying about things being played perfectly. Um, with that being said, I'll go back to the slides. I'll just play this little passage with this melody, and you'll just hear the harmonics kind of coming in and out the whole time. screen sharing again. I apologise, one of the, um, the slides I was a little bit slow in forwarding it. The problem is I get, I actually quite like listening to my own clips sometimes and so I forgot. I'm really sorry. Um, and I want to skip ahead a little bit and talk about a piece that has been composed within lockdown. Um, and this is really fun because usually when I'm talking about a piece it's finished. Um, I do have a recording of some of this piece but it's not actually finished yet. Um, partly because of time and, and other circumstances, but I'll, I'll take you right into this now. So screen sharing again for most of this next session. Okay. 
so Intimate Instruments is, is the working title. And this is written for four very good friends of mine who I have worked together with in some cases for nearly two decades. Um, it's not commissioned work such as the other few that you heard. Um, I just want to write it and I also want to write it so that the players can play it and get some work. So some of you may know these names. Um, Richard Harwood actually plays quite often in Dublin um, with one of the orchestras there and has played um, concertos and things. But they're a wonderful um, group of players and we actually work every year on the Sound of Music Summer School. Um, Denise had mentioned um, my, my work with them. And so over 12 years of working together with them, creating the music of, of young composers, I really feel that, that all five of us know each other really well. So there was a lot of collaboration here. Um, this is one of the shots from me working at home. You can, you can see I've got a bit of the music. I'm listening to Tom record it. Um, even the recording process was really important here, the kind of workshopping process. Um, again, I'm just going to come out of the, the slides just because in this environment it's just nice to see people. Um, I was thinking of different ways of recording it. So sometimes they might record it with uh, a metronome. Sometimes they might record it listening to someone else who'd recorded it first. And so that started to actually affect the compositional process. So I was actually thinking while I was writing this, how are we going to record it? Um, now, there are many composers currently creating pieces in this kind of new environment and thinking of works that will be created and, and performed within lockdown conditions. So there's nothing in any way new about what I'm doing here, except it's been fascinating for me to reflect on some of these performance questions that I'm asking myself, things that I've talked to you about already. You know, how do performers negotiate intonation when they're playing together? And what happens to that when they can't hear each other? When I'm in an environment where I can actually be thinking ahead of something. Okay, I'm going to write here so that the cello line dominates. And then I want other people to listen to it and play against it. Um, of course, that's what performers do all the time when they're playing chamber music or, or other kind of ensemble music. They're constantly making these negotiations. And it's also fair to say that composers often will write chamber music thinking about how the performers are going to negotiate it. So again, I, I'm, I'm not claiming that there's anything particularly new about this, um, other than just the fact that I was going to be literally recording this in different ways and thinking about that was going to be important. Now I'm going to go back into the, the screen share and I'll just give you an example of something else that I've been working with with the group. So going back to this nice um, photo there of, of Hannah. So in advance of the Sound of Music Summer School, that was going to be taught completely online with all the performers. We did end up actually recording the works um, at a recording studio in London, only because that worked much better. And I think it was a better experience actually for the young composers. And I, I do feel that they, they benefited from that. But what you're going to, to see, I just realized I wasn't actually sharing here. There we go. Um, Oops, sorry, let me just back up there. You're just going to see a bit of a video. Now, this was just a kind of educational demonstration. I was talking to the young composers about harmony. So here we're talking about kind of, if you like, modal composition. What happens when you're only using the notes of C major, for example? So I simply asked the performers, without knowing what anyone else had done, can you please just do a short improvisation, 20 seconds to 30 seconds, only using the notes of C major? So I also said, can you make it a little bit slow? That's all I said. And then I said, OK, now can you do another short improvisation just using the notes of E flat major? And can you make this one a little bit jollier than the first one? So here are the results. Um, I just put all the videos together, which, as I'm sure you know, if you use software like Filmora, is actually ridiculously easy to do. So here you see what happens.
was um, very jolly. Um, it's something that we actually we do live many times in a workshop situation anyway. Um, now, I'm, I'm sharing this with the permission of, of the performers. In the C major version, you do hear that sometimes the intonation is a little bit odd. It certainly wouldn't have been had they played together. A little bit less so, perhaps for obvious reasons, because it's faster in, in the E flat major. Um, but this was one example of even in, in the educational work that I was doing with them, with these young composers who are between the ages of 14 and 18 on the Sunday Music Summer School, I wanted still to be thinking about what happens in performance, how people perform together. So I'm going to go straight into my, my own work, which as I say is very much in progress. It's going to be about 20 minutes long. Um, at the moment it's 12 minutes, so that's not too bad. Um, I'm showing you and, and you're gonna hear part of about four minutes of it in different clips. So going back here. So just thinking about my knowledge that this would be recorded separately, right from the beginning, um, this is transposed, so the, the cornet's playing a, a concert D. Um, but thinking about, I was really interested with this opening to think about something that was quite strictly notated, but would actually sound very free anyway. Um, I'm a massive fan of using fairly straightforward rhythms to make things sound much, I, I won't use the word complex, that's, that's not what I mean, but it'd be pretty hard to dictate some of this rhythmically if you had to, and I'm not gonna make you, don't worry. Um, but simply put, when you put triplets and, and semiquavers together, particularly when there isn't an overriding sense of pulse, such as here, really interesting things begin to happen. Um, over the page, that's kind of one example of it. And throughout this kind of opening passage, I was, I was thinking about different ways of writing for the ensemble, with the idea that the cello is gonna dominate this section. So it usually starts off this little semiquaver idea that you can hear. Um, here as well, thinking about intonation. Now, even if the players were playing together, this is quite problematic in terms of intonation. So you have this, um, the, the tremolo on the fifth partial harmonic on, on the C string of the cello there. It always, the, the tunings are a little bit funny. Um, you've got the low flute, you've got, you've got the clarinet at the top of its, its kind of shallow register. So some lovely kind of intonation things already this keeps on going. So, so even here, for instance, changing the G to the, the C fingering harmonic on the flute, that already has a, a change in pitch that's going to be very discernible. Then that's mixed with the, the violins harmonic. Much of this going throughout. Um, here as well, different types of harmonics, different types of tremolos even, and um, tremolos and trills um, on any kind of wind instrument, but in this case on on any kind of instrument, but in this case on wind instruments, already begins to kind of modify pitch. The cello gradually is, is kind of asserting its dominant um, dominance melodically, and all the players listen to this before they recorded it. So Richard recorded his part first, just listened to a metronome, not even a click track, and just recorded it. I also use recordings in different ways. So um, one of the performers actually recorded listening to all three that had been mixed together already. Then as you can imagine, something like this, even live, becomes asynchronous anyway. Um, and this was again an idea, just to, just to see what would happen. Um, it was also, I have to say, ludicrously easy um, almost frighteningly easy to, to mix it all together because if you've got people just repeating things then you can easily just cut little snippets out if you want to, to get things in a line. So this was what I had initially, in fact this was what I presented on uh, at a conference in, in, in May, so it was the very start of the piece, you're going to hear this, it's only about 90 seconds just to give you a taste. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so that was the, the first section. And then I wanted to start thinking about a different way of, of exploring the ensemble's capabilities of, of playing in isolation. Um, I'll, I will take some questions in, in five minutes when I, I finish, but I'd be really interested in following the score and listening to it, how obvious you felt it was that they had not recorded it together. Um, so moving on here, um, you can see some of the same ideas from before, sharing sounds. And I was trying something here, uh, what I felt at the time was a little bit more dangerous, more difficult. So playing with the idea of a line that's essentially moving through slow glissandos. Now, initially, this passage, for instance, all fair enough, things are just kind of moving around, making chords. But then here, in green, essentially it's just a, a, a unison again, a, a monody, if you like. And so, if you think it's hard for players to play in tune when they can't hear each other, which it is, um, imagine how difficult it is for them to gauge glissandos, the speed of it, for example. So all this stuff I, I, I kind of felt was, was, was going to be kind of challenging, but at the same time I was really fascinated to hear how it was going to sound. Again, kind of playing with, with different kind of dynamic levels all over the place. Here there's a, a chord which just keeps on moving around in terms of colour. And again, I'll make no bones about it, you'll hear that sometimes certain notes are clearly out of tune. Um, and again, I just, I just really enjoy that. Um, you might be thinking, why don't, you, why don't I just use quarter tones um, or other kinds of microtonal notation? And I'll address that in a moment. Here, now the violin dominates. Um, it's a very kind of physical kind of gesture. And this had been recorded first, and then other players are, are listening to it. And towards the end of this particular passage, um, really exploring sounds which get into areas of what are sometimes called prescriptive notations. So if you have a look at the, the violin, for example, what you hear is nothing like it looks. Um, even in terms of the contour of the pitch, it keeps on moving around. At the end of this passage, um, you're not even going to hear this bit in green because that bit ha uh, hadn't been recorded yet. But all of these kinds of kind of slightly changing the instrument, not playing with the left hand key um, in the flute, completely changes the pitch. Um, again, the use of the first right hand key in the clarinet passage there, it will sound very, very strange indeed. But I kind of worked on that already with the performers. Okay, so um, I've actually timed this surprisingly well. So I've got about another three minutes. I think the next passage is going to be about two and a half minutes. So you're going to hear from, not all the way from the beginning again, but from the end of that cello solo going forward. <laughs>
So it begins to sound quite chaotic at the end. Um, and actually, for the next couple of minutes, it gets even more chaotic. I was really um, just interested in exploring what had been quite small aspects of, of each instrument. I, I said I'd address quarter tones. Um, I do use quarter tones, um, not as many times as other composers. Um, quarter tones for me are the really interesting one because, gosh, it's hard enough for performers to play semitones. Um, now, of course, some instruments are built around quarter tones and, and how they can work, um, and, and that's all great. I'm, I'm a massive fan of it, actually. But I still can't get my head around the fact, I mean this honestly and artistically, I can't get my head around the fact that players don't play in tune anyway. And that's already what I really enjoy. Um, and, and this is a really tough thing. I, I've said before, I've, I've ha I sometimes have to be very careful. Um, I've sometimes even done it in orchestral music. I, I don't think I write difficult music. I try not to write music that's technically difficult to play. But I do write music that sometimes I know is going to sound out of tune. Um, and it's about the hardest thing to kind of convey to performers. Um, because, I mean, I'm a performer myself. You know, we, do, we don't want to, to sound bad. So there's a little bit of a, a kind of dicey ethical area that I think sometimes I'm, I'm actually inhabiting. Um, so just a final um, bit of slides, and then I'll come back out. Simply to give you um, not very many references, but some of the earlier ones. Um, particularly quite a lot of the research in music psychology, I think, can be really relevant to, to some of what I've been talking about here and, and thinking about. So thanks again for listening. Um, you've been a really nice audience. And I'm very happy to take any questions or indeed just comments. Thank you.